you know, seeing a dying German bank, uh, you know, really kind of gets you pessimistic about like, you know, the traditional banking system and made us really kind of excited about what's going on in crypto and kind of like the opportunity to build this like parallel financial system. This is probably like in a weird way, um, the most bullish I've been in a while, maybe, maybe ever for crypto. There's going to be a scenario where governments are actually helping us, you know, push crypto forward. This episode is brought to you by Anoma, the universal intent machine introducing a new era of applications where you define the outcomes you want. To stay up to date with Anoma, you can follow them at x.com slash Anoma or sign up for the newsletter at anoma.net. Special thanks to Anoma for sponsoring today's episode. Real is a permissionless L2 designed for tokenized real world assets. They've just launched their rewards program. So get started at re.al slash rewards and be sure to use the code in the show notes below. Special thanks to Real for sponsoring today's episode. Everyone knows there's a massive shortage of top senior marketers in crypto and teams are constantly struggling to get their go to market done right. That's why we're excited to have partnered up with Renault Partners, the premier go to market advisory firm for early stage crypto teams. Get in touch with their team by heading on over to renaudpartners.com or giving the co-founder Jeff a follow on X. Check out the links in the description below. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Empire. Uh, the other day we dropped a new podcast in the feed and gave absolutely zero context. Um, so that podcast is from the Delphi folks. Um, I've known their crew for a very long time. I feel like we... Uh, Delphi and Blockworks kind of grew up together uh, in a sense. And so, yeah, I wanted to bring three of the co-founders, Jose, Jan, and Anil on the pod. Talk about the Delphi story, talk about what they're seeing in the market. They've got a big research arm, venture arm, a whole bunch of fun stuff we can talk about. So, gents, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. Yeah. Thanks for having us. It's been a long you. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anil, how was the show the other day? It's fun. Um, yeah, always fun to have, like, get all the people together in New York. Um, been here for a few weeks now and it's like the energy here is like you know best crypto hub for sure you guys think new york is the is the best crypto city in the world right now yeah i think so some people someone was arguing lisbon which jose you're you're based there so you, you tell us so, someone was arguing jose is like this <laughs> yeah. on me with a mustache <laughs> yeah. no i think in spite of itself new york's probably still still the best lisbon's pretty good lisbon has more uh, actually that's not true i think new york has a lot of builders too but Lisbon has a lot of like top people and Maker, Gnosis, um, a lot of OGs here as well. I think pretty much if you're not, yeah, like most, I think Europeans or people that aren't American end up here. Also a lot of Americans actually, but especially like yeah. if you're European or, or not American, you, you you tend to end up in Lisbon. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty good. Pretty good Pets guys, here. right? Athena. Like, there's a lot yeah. Of yeah, guy from, yeah, guy from Athena is here. The Pip guys are up north actually, in, uh, but, but they come here quite often uh yeah a bunch of people nice so i want to talk about just like just this cycle and anil and i were having drinks the other night and just talking about like are, are there any narratives that are going to pop up and like how, how are people making money these days in crypto and i want to talk about all that but uh, i thought it'd be an interesting place to start just talking about like the delphi story um and you guys have these like different arms of the business i've, I've always found it very impressive you have five or six or seven co-founders, which is like always seems crazy to me and is very like uh, atypical for how startups are built. So maybe Neil, if I could throw it to you to just like share how Delphi went from this like little, I remember when you guys had just like, you were just doing some like research reports yeah. and, uh, and, and then now you're this like large company. So to like, yeah, tell me the Delphi story. Yeah, for sure. So originally it was four co-founders, but we do definitely consider it seven. And I'll, I'll kind of talk about how each one is kind of like joined along the way. Um, basically Jan, MJ, Kevin, and I, we all like, you know, uh, started in TradFi, worked at Bloomberg, worked at Deutsche Bank. Basically my whole professional life has been with these guys by my side. Um, and yeah, honestly, we, you know, at Deutsche Bank, uh, Jan and I were actually on the same team there. Um, we fell down the crypto rabbit hole and, you know, seeing a dying German bank, uh, you know, really kind of gets you pessimistic about like, you know, the traditional banking system and made us really kind of excited about what's going on. In crypto and kind of like the opportunity to build this like parallel financial system. So essentially in 2018, um, we left our jobs, um, you know, looked crazy to our whole team. Um, you know, our MD actually told Jan and I that like, you know, it, it's okay if you leave and try this Bitcoin stuff, but because like if it fails, 
you can just come back here. And I think Jan and I were both in agreement that we were never going to end up back at Deutsche Bank. But essentially started Delphi as a research firm because we thought, you know, if we could get paid to learn about this industry that we were super excited about, it'd feel like cheating. And obviously, given our backgrounds, we thought we were, you know, best fit to kind of like bring that value to the space. Um, essentially, first year and, you know, you probably know this. Daniel, I have an amazing picture that I found from the early oh days. Oh my God. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, literally, I mean, you guys were the only ones really holding like any, you know, good events um, and always around the city. So yeah, we, we came a lot. Um, and Anil, the, yeah, the, crypto I, really I like ages you. you. Yeah. What did you say? Yeah. Crypto really ages you. Holy shit. <laughs> this is when you were I, still Jan Lieberman, CFA, Kaya. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, mean, Daniel, like, I could barely tell that was you like the glasses the like dapper haircut that might have been the last time we ever wore suits <laughs> yeah it's pretty incredible yeah wow so, anyways go ahead Daniel. go ahead yeah damn um wow that's a flashback um yeah so basically in 2018 yeah like right around when we were going to these events and stuff like um, we were writing a lot of research, but no one was paying us for it. There were like no real fundamental investors in the space. Like we had like two clients, like, you know, shout out hash and like multi-coin. Um, and basically like the way that we started, um, making a name for ourselves was writing these really deep dive reports where we, we were trying to like propose certain things. So Jan kind of pioneered a lot of this, um, the huddle waves analysis, um, he, he kind of built on top of some of the work that other people did, but used it to call the Bitcoin for, uh, the bottom for Bitcoin back in 2018. That report is still out by the way. So I think it's like always worth checking. Cause like he was actually right to like literally the week. Um, so that was always impressive. And then, um, we wrote this big report on Ethereum and actually what we were trying to walk through on, on that report in Ethereum was why the economics of E2.0 didn't make sense from like a security perspective. And again, we had just published a deep dive on Bitcoin calling like the bottom and on ETH, we were saying, hey, this is like a risk. And so a lot of the ETH maxis back then were kind of very, um, you know, upset with us. I don't know, Jan, if you remember that, but like literally it was at the first time we ever got like hate and we're like, we're just trying to help. What, what, when is this? Give me like a timestamp on this. Well, I think February 2019. Um, so okay. early Q1 2019. Um, and it was, it, it was like, I remember, you know, the Bitcoin report grew us from like zero to a thousand followers. This was like one to 10,000 followers, whatever. But I just remember that was the first day we were getting hate. We were like, man, like, what did we do wrong? But then within 24 hours of that report releasing, actually Vitalik and the whole E2.0 core team reached out to us, asked us for our models. And we ended up hopping on a call, sharing like, kind of like how we walked through, you know, the report and how we were thinking about things. And then like a month later, Vitalik ended up you know, pushing through a proposal and then um, shouting us out on some podcasts like Laura Shin and stuff. Um, and that's really when the floodgates of uh, Delphi, like consulting really uh, uh, started kind of like opening. We started working with a lot of the protocols that, you know, we were really, you know, we, we helped work on a lot of like DeFi with, you know, synthetics, Compound, Aave. We helped transition from ETH Lend to there. And um, yeah, honestly, it made us like, I think that was one of the biggest inflection points of Delphi early on because, you know, transparently, when we joined, we were really excited about the space. Um, we thought they were like some of the smartest people we had ever met in the space. And in some ways, we thought, you know, by building this picks and shovels business, we were just going to ride the coattails of this like industry that we thought was going to be, you know, up only. Um, obviously, that was not the case. Uh, and basically, I think like when we were on that phone uh, call with Vitalik and like thinking about, you know, sharing our models and everything like that, I think that was the first like real inflection point for Delphi where we were like, hey, you know, we're going to be part of making this, uh, you know, whole industry happen. And I think after that, we kind of gained a lot of confidence in working with a lot of these projects. And I think it was, and maybe Jan, you might remember better, but I think it was either Kane or Stanley. We were like doing some consulting for them. And, you know, back then we were just like, you know, we just wanted to provide as much value as possible. I think like we were hopping on this car, we're like, oh man, we think we we're providing value, but like just in case, like, they have any pushback, we're going to give them maybe like an extra month of, you know, consulting or something like that. And before we could even get started, I think it was Kane. He was like, hey, man, like you guys don't have, you know, back then we were, uh, we were actually designing Axie at that point. And we were talking to him about like what we're doing with Axie, all this gaming stuff. I think uh, it was him who was like, hey, listen, you guys have no idea how valuable it is to have a team like yours that, um, you know, we're so, you know, folk, heads down focused on building synthetics that we can't look up and see what our competitors are doing, let alone what's happening in the sector of gaming that no one else is talking about or thinking about, mm. right? So that really informed us on, I think, you know, building out uh, kind of subject matter expertise across not just every kind of like sector that we thought was going to exist in crypto, but also every different perspective. So that's kind of how you got to the Delphi that, you know, everyone knows of today. 
which is you know Delphi Research, um, Delphi Ventures, and Delphi Labs, where we build projects. And then this, this is you know I know the podcast is called the Hive Mind. That's where we kind of like coined the term a lot. Is um, we any decision that we have that is like you know a big like we always trying to get these different perspectives. So you get this you know an, analytical perspective via research, this builder's mindset via labs, and then this investor's mindset via ventures. And I think it gives us this like really unique seat in the market that you know you can only get by having people super deep uh, from all angles. And then when did, so you had, so it was MJ, so MJ, and then MJ left obviously went to start the fund and then it was Jan and Kevin and you. And then when did Jose and Tom Tommy and, and yeah. is, it, is Pierce like tech? Is uh, he, I mean, yeah. Pierce came with me. Yeah. Pierce came with you. So what's, what's that yeah. story? Uh, yeah, you want to tell the Tommy one? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. So to Tommy. I, re- I remember meeting Tommy. He was doing, I think, 51%, 51% of the research. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I remember obviously, that too. Yeah, obviously, back then, there weren't many um, research shops in this space, right? Um, I, I actually, the like basically, the month that we started, I believe the block, um, you know, Misari, actually, you guys too, right? And us all. It was, it was that like Q1, Q2, 2018. It yeah, was like- exactly. Decrypt launch, Masari launch, the block launch. Yeah, we we were in August of twenty eighteen. So actually, we're on. We're, we're about to be, um, yeah, six years, like literally this week. So this is actually really timely. Um, yeah, nice. But basically, um, after that Bitcoin report, um, so Pomp was like an advisor to uh, Tom, and um, basically he saw the Bitcoin report and was like, and you know, hey Tom, as an advisor, you should work with these guys. They're really good. Um, he connected us and. You know, Jan, MJ, Kevin, and I, obviously we were like, you know, best friends and everything like that, but we basically all had the same network, right? And I think one thing that we immediately saw with Tom was obviously loved his energy. He was putting in the grind and he was like a one man, you know, shop at that point. And we were kind of like impressed by how hard he was grinding and um, how much, you know, time he was putting in. And yeah, we had like one meeting, uh, was supposed to be 30 minutes. I think we sat there in that room for like three hours, just chatting and getting to know each other. And then- um, you know, within a month or two, we ended up doing kind of like this merger where he kind of joined Delphi um, and, and brought his old network and everything like that. And then, yeah, we we never never like looked back since. Um, the Jose and uh, Pierce story is well, pretty funny. It was the Ethereum report as well, right? Like you guys cited. That's how we first got to. Yeah, yeah, yeah true. Jose research. always loves to tell this part because my my part of the story is a little bit more funny. <laughs> Jose, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, yeah, you guys you guys came to me. <laughs> Yeah, you, that, that's, you guys a, that's a generous way to put it. <laughs> yeah, that is, maybe I can tell the true story and then I'll tell, I'll tell the I'll tell the true story. Okay, so okay. The, these guys, uh, I was I was like doing my own uh, token econ stuff and um, working at a place called called Amazix, which was like uh, it's a funny story from back in the day. Um, people who were around in 2017 will, will remember that name. Doing like research and token econ, wrote a report on Ethereum close to the. Well, I say close to the bottom, then it dropped another like 70% or something or 60% since that report. But it was like when everyone was basically really bearish ETH, I wrote a report about why I was bullish ETH and like the fat protocol thesis basically, which cited like a bunch of stuff, including the burn, which eventually happened like three years later and, and stuff like this. And these guys basically cited that in that report. And then Tommy invited me on the podcast to basically debate an ETH bear. Um, I don't even remember the name of the ETH bear I debated on the, on the Delphi podcast. But anyway, we started like working together more closely, like uh, started working together on a lot of consulting gigs because we had a lot of deal flow that we uh, c- can take up as well. Ended up, and then also uh, the fund actually came from this interaction too, right? I had a anchor investor for, for a fund that we were going to do with uh, my previous company, but ended up like, I, I just knew that like, I really respected Delphi. They were like the best research shop in the space. And then I met them in New York. Um, some might say stalked in, in, in New York. And then uh, realized like we also got along really well. And so I, I was like, why don't we just do this fund together? Like I have this anchor investor, you guys uh, are like on it. You know, they, they like found synthetics really early. We were discussing plays all the time. And so the idea was I just bring this anchor investor and we do Delphi Ventures together. Uh, and we're all as equal partners kind of thing. And that's kind of how, how uh, like we came together. And then there's a long story with the anchor investor that we can get into. He like, it was initially, it was like a $25 million commitment Then it went down to like 20, then 10, then five, then two, (laughs) like through the bear market. It was like the commitments kept going down. And then eventually he like rugged us entirely and was like, hey, I'm not going to invest. When we already, we had already like 
we, we were just producing more and more documents for this guy. Like, yeah, like never produced so much documentation, years. traveled around the world. I literally never yeah, worked so hard we didn't for anything have. in my entire life. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Did, money did, the, did, the guy, did the guy have the money looking back? TV. No. TV. Nah, I didn't. I, I'm, yeah. I'm like, because like once, so basically we had the, we negotiated our first investment with the fund, which was Thorchain, um, which was basically all the money we, we, we had, we, we put into Thorchain. And at, the, at this point, we still thought the guy might have the money. And so we let him invest. And at that point, the investment was already up like 8x. So he was, he was like arbing into a, to an 8x like fund and he still couldn't find the money. Like he couldn't find 50. Oh, yeah, he did, so, he did, so this guy didn't have he the was, money. He was just a middleman. Like he was, a, and we, we have a, like I was, I, I, Piers and I spent a lot of time doing the, the fundraising, like for maybe for a year, we were just traveling around meeting all sorts of like unsavory characters all over the world. Like <laughs> craziest stories, like people trying to hand us briefcases of cash and stuff. Um, and, and yeah, this, we, we met a lot of, there's a lot of like, middle like, And this is when I took up uh, martial arts is uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the briefcase. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of middlemen LARPing as principles in, in, yeah. in finance, but in crypto, especially like, you know, right. and you get to the end and you're like, oh, let me just call my friend or whatever. And it, you know, so that, that was what this guy was. Um, yeah. So Funny stories from that time, like from just the investors that we met. Uh, so when did you guys realize that, when did you guys realize that the way that you would actually make money was from investing, not from research? Because the way that I understand your guys is like the way that I understand your business model is you have research, like consulting slash services, and then the venture arm and like research and consulting makes money, which is awesome. And it's, and, and I'm sure it's profitable and makes, makes a lot of money, but really it's there to serve as like kicking off for the like trying to find the hundred X's on the venture yeah. side, which you guys were able to do in the last cycle. Um, so like, when did you guys have that realization and and tell me if I'm wrong or, or, or not? No, or not wrong. <clears throat> I mean, I think the end goal was always to invest in a structured way, right? Through a fund. Uh, we were always investing with PAs. And, and so when we first started, we didn't really have a background in crypto and, and our backgrounds were on the sell side, right? So we didn't really have an investing background either. It was, it was writing research and, and, and making calls, but there wasn't any direct fund management experience. Uh, so for us, you know, we thought the, the best path to getting there was through research initially and, and building a history of, of, of good calls, building a deeper understanding while continuing to invest personally, and then eventually launching a fund. And so we thought that the, the end goal was certainly a fund and a research business, but we thought that the, the best path to getting there and or the, the highest uh, probability path of getting there was, was going with research first, um, particularly with, you know, the positions we were in when we first started research there, we just realistically couldn't have launched a fund at the time. We, it, it wouldn't have really taken off we didn't have any any network to even raise money even through. when you already when like you already had the brand right like and it was still hard to to raise a fund in 2019 like for for those who don't know we ended up just having to put in our own money like delphi ventures fund one yeah. had we no ended external up investors in apr cards and just uh levering up which we don't recommend not not financial advice but at that point it was <laughs> like recommend months it. yeah <laughs> we've been with each other yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because we but even then, and you had a really strong brand, right? Like a, a lot of really good calls, synthetics, and I think that also helps understand once you have like funds that are subscribers that end up making way more money <laughs> off off your calls than, than than you actually do. It kind of like sinks in pretty fast. But even then, it was hard to raise money, so we ended up just having to put in our own money, which was obviously ended up working out really well for us because um, you know we kept a hundred rather than twenty percent carry or whatever, and it was also a lot of fun. Like I think it's one of the yeah. I always say like managing your own money with, with your friends, like the setup that we have is like the best job ever. Cause you don't have uh clients and you don't have bosses either, which are two like awkward sort of like rela mm -hmm. professional relationships, right? You're just literally like live and die by the quality of your own decisions. Um, and you're just doing it, trying to do it the best way possible with, with people you really so, love and have gone through a lot. So what's, so, the, yeah. what's the structure, right? So what's the structure of ventures or, or maybe I'm sure it's changed over the years. And I don't know if you let employees invest and stuff like that, but was it just uh, like a even split amongst you guys? Did you all put in the same amount of money? On, yeah. And the first one, yeah, we basically, it, you know, give or take five, 10% here, there based on, you know, what people were able, sure. able to scrap together, but directionally everyone was 
in the same place. Um, do you, Jan, do you remember like the percent? Because I'm assuming, you, I mean, you guys were pretty young and like, I'm, I'm assuming not like very cash rich. Um, so do you like, do you remember how much people actually put in in that first one? And do you remember it being like a large percentage of your liquid net worth at the time? No, I mean, I, I think technically it. it was over it was 100% more, of our liquid. Yeah. I mean, it was like, yeah. I put in everything in my bank account and got three credit cards from Discovery. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, we, yeah, we were levered. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The first investment was Rune. And then we were all holding Rune in PA and expecting it to pump so we could make our capital calls for the next, I mean, you know, if we, if we defaulted on the capital calls, we'd be defaulting on ourselves. So like, it wasn't, it wasn't a huge issue, but we, we, I think the money we committed for all of us was probably like more than, or, or about a hundred percent of our liquid for net sure. worth. So like, um, it was really thinking about what else we could have Delphi do to contribute to the space. Cause you know, the overall vision and mission for Delphi is to make crypto happen sooner and better than it would without us. Um, and basically every decision we do across these three divisions is really thinking about, you know, what are we contributing at the end of the day? Um, and, uh, you know, like Jose said, the biggest benefit, I think, is like we don't have, uh, you know, other investors or LPs or anything like that in, you know, really any of the businesses, right? Research 2 has never raised. So you have no investors in Delphi, you have no outside investor LPs in the fund, you have none of that? No, yeah. Um, Labs did a small raise for like an accelerator that they did, right? Yeah. But um, research has no investors too. So for us, I think, you know, um, it comes with trade-offs for sure. But I think one of the biggest benefits is it allows us to think in crazy, like crazy ideas in ways that, you know, if you bring this to an investor that, you know, you know, came to you and said, hey, build a scalable research business out or something like that, um, we can go and do things that like no other firm can really think about or do because we're just working for ourselves at this, you know, at, at the end of the day. Um, so I think that's really what was so exciting as well as now we're still managing like mid uh, nine figures. Um, so yeah, it's still, uh, yeah, it, it, it still, you know, allows us this opportunity, but yeah, nothing really changed that much. Um, I think mm -hmm. it was just a number on the screen. I think at least for me, yeah, I don't know what you guys think. Jan, I'll throw that one over to you. Yeah. Cause I mean, you had a, I mean, like <laughs> just, just Axie it, itself, like must've been a crazy ride up, both on the up and the down. Yeah, it, and it, it happened so quickly. Um, so it, it definitely felt surreal. Uh, we no one really went crazy with any kind of expenditures, right, or or, or anything like that. So it 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 felt mostly like a number on a screen, right? It, it was just Other than retreats, which we can get into yeah. too. But, but that's another story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and a cloud, an cloud couch, right? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so it it. it it in reality could have been a very different number in terms of, you know, how that impacted lifestyle or anything like that, like a much smaller number. And it just felt like something, something kind of crazy on a screen. And, and um, yeah, because it happened so fast, it, it was still just kind of, you're staring at it like, okay, uh, this is what's happening now. And um, naturally, you know, it, it, as part of crypto, as it comes up quickly, it, it, it kind of comes down quickly. And so, um, you, you kind of get numb to the volatility in, in both directions. Yeah, Booming. I think that's it. Just like the volatility, because think about it, like we had a million bucks maybe like uh, a year and a bit before then, right? We put in a million bucks and then it went up to like, I remember it went up to like six or something. You were already super excited. And then the, the, the swings, obviously like even DeFi summer swings for us, you feel, you really feel them because it's like a hundred percent of our net worth is in this fund. And it's like more money than any of us have ever, have ever seen. Um, and we were basically holding through the entire entirety of all of that. So there's definitely a lot of, definitely, I feel like a, you know, like a broken rubber, like rubber band or something like it just doesn't react anymore when, when to market volatility, but yeah, the number I echo what these guys said didn't matter that much. Like that was way beyond my number for sort of what I needed to. The only to thing that changed was we and, our credit cards, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I remember yeah, we hit that number. Card. I was like, I should probably pay off my credit card. How did you guys make decisions? So, like, let's say, okay, let, okay, let's use Axie as an example. Axie went up like a hundred x in like yeah. a month or two or something, which was just I remember it was like one of the craziest. I mean, I've, you guys and many other friends who made like life changing amounts of money like simply off Axie. Did any of you guys say let's sell, <laughs> let's sell at some point, or like, yeah, maybe like how do you? Can... Have, <laughs> it's really a question about decision making. Like when you have seven people making decisions, these are yeah. Uh, there, this it's, is like it's a two part answer. I'd say like yeah. this is where the hive mind really comes in. Um, actually, was you know we we work really closely with that team. 
Um, we're like still, you know, very bullish on those guys. I think like Ronan is like going to be, you know, a, a big sleeper uh, in, in this cycle as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, literally, you know, every other fund who was invested in Axie sold, I think before $10. Um, we did not sell any before that. And by the way, like it wasn't because we didn't want to. Um, some of us in the fund, like, you know, MJ and myself were like, yo, Jan, we should probably take some off the table. Um, and usually it is kind of like, you know, by committee, but Jan was definitely closest to this and, you know, diamond handed us. Yeah, I think, I think, uh, yeah, I think at that point, I, I like Jan, I don't remember what was the first price. Was it like the $37 or like the 75 or something? But we diamond handed it um, a lot, mostly because of Jan's conviction. Um, and we were all really bullish, but at some point we were just like, this is way, this is um, kind of insane. Um, like we got to take something off the table. And remember like, at that point, we only had maybe like five to six investments, right? Axie was our second investment. Rune was our first one. Um, and then, yeah, like uh, it, it was kind of insane. But basically, you know, how we make decisions is really based off this hive mind approach where um, everyone kind of have, has a different perspective. Usually if you don't have, you know, like some, you know, um, specific knowledge on that topic, you're not going to, you're going to kind of like sit back and listen. Um, because within Delphi, we're going to have at least four to five people who have really good subject matter expertise and thoughts on that specific topic. Um, now I'd say we have a much better process because like we have, you know, a much yeah. bigger team, right? We have around like uh, uh, around 100 people across the three, three divisions. Um, so that really allows for, you know, we can talk to our macro markets team about what they're thinking from a macro level and then kind of dig deep into, hey, the gaming analysts or something like that. Um, and then obviously talk to, you know, the ventures team and figure out who's closest to the deal and what, what they're thinking is happening and everything like that. Yeah. So, so yeah. yeah, early on it was, you know, by committee with increased weights towards people who, who had either some additional understanding, a uh, higher level of conviction because they're doing more research or, or has have historically been kind of better at judging certain things. And, and I think, you know, everyone was pretty good at understanding who excelled where and, and well, long investment committees sometimes like seven people like try to debate MJ on you know like uh, there was long <laughs> some long investment committees with the committee oh yeah process. they would get aggressive yeah. too we're, because yeah. we're all the best friends right so uh, and, and I think one of the best parts about um, us having this relationship is like there's we really like leave ego at the door um, at the end of the day all we care about is coming to the best decision for all of us right um, yeah. So yeah it definitely got very heated um, it was a lot of fun yeah for sure Sorry, Jan, I, I interrupted you. Okay. No, nah, no worries. And then basically it was going to say, you know, over time, um, you know, now the operation exists as three kind of separate companies. And and so there's people that are, are heading up each division and they effectively kind of have um, decision-making power in, in that specific area. But there's still, you know, broader conversations that we all have and catch ups and, and discussing what's kind of going on and, and gathering feedback and information. But but ultimately now, rather than, you know, rule by committee, which made sense when we were a lot smaller and, and that wasn't a roadblock, but rather kind of a, you know, a, a source of strength. Now there's a bit more separation uh, that mm -hmm. allows kind of the businesses to, to run smoothly. And you know, the same way, yeah, I can't imagine running just like a large entity with that many people making decisions because there's just no way everyone's going to have the, the necessary right. info. So everyone told us it wouldn't work, uh, actually, right initially. But actually, I think it worked really well for us the the committee thing because we just had to debate things. We, it was very, we had very little money, so we couldn't really afford to make mistakes, and we had to debate things to death to where we understood every failure scenario to the nth degree and could kind of really prepare well for it. And then I think over the years, we kind of figured out who's who was better at it, who was better at other things, and like optimized and and had people focus on what they were good at. Who runs each team? Yeah, so basically uh, myself and Kevin run research, Jose and Luke run labs, then Jan and Tommy run uh, ventures. So you kind of have like an even split. Um, um, and then obviously we, you know, catch up quite often, basically every day. Nice. Um, do employees get to invest in the, in the venture fund? Yeah, yeah. So basically what we've kind of done is since then, um, we're on our, our third fund now. And, and the idea is, you know, what we wanted to do early on was always invest early stage. Uh, that's where we saw the best returns. That's where we thought we had the best ability to kind of uh, distinguish winners from losers and, and, and where you got paid the most to be 
early and, and right on, on trends and ideas. And so, you know, we still think that that's where the best edge is and, and that's where the, the best opportunity is. So what we do is we kind of, uh, once with that first fund, you know, we, we, in theory could have continued to operate that indefinitely, but it, it made sense to, um, as we grew, create a way for everyone or, or high performers within the, the, the businesses to kind of participate in, in the fund as well. And so, mm. um, we kind of do these smaller funds that we deploy and then we, we launch a new one and the idea is, you know, there, there's turnover, um, some people get a, some uh, additional liquidity. And, and so now it gives them kind of periodic opportunities to, to invest how much they want uh, in, into these funds. And, and, um, and, it, and it kind of allows everything to stay current and up to date and, and kind of keeps us investing in, in those smaller areas. We still do a couple of large deals. I'd say, you know, 80% of our, of our checks are probably in the 500 to one and a half range, but, you know, we've done checks that are much larger and then we'll also do checks that are smaller when there's just not really the opportunity to put in additional money. Hmm. Um, you guys ever think about selling the research business and or selling the consulting business and just doing ventures? Like, I'm sure you could have, like, do you get any offers for research or consulting over the yeah. years? Like, Yeah, we definitely got into offers over the years. I think, it is really good um, signal for where we are in the cycle. To be honest, I need the, I need the real story, Neil, because when I said that, the three of you all just got uh, big smiles on your face. Yeah, so. yeah, no, we, we've gotten <laughs> we've gotten some um, insane offers. There's um, mixed opinions on this internally on this plan internally. Mm. <laughs> they, they, we, we've gotten some insane offers in the past. I think um, for what's us, the big what's the biggest offer you got? Uh, well, honestly, the number like I don't think the numbers were real because it was mostly in you know another company's stock, which you know I, I don't want to like reveal or anything like that. But um, uh, it was yeah, honestly, it was right before Axie too, right? If it's the one I'm thinking yeah, about, yeah, yeah. And, and at so, the end of the day, we were just waiting. By the end of it, we're like, maybe yeah. we buy you. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, we realized that we we're way more bullish on you know Delphi equity than you know another company's equity. Um, and I think like, you know, the way that I think about selling the research business is like, we're always open to the conversations and stuff like that too. But I think the one thing that we all do agree on is like, at the end of the day, like just having, you know, even from the ventures standpoint, right? Like having this research business that has like this objective to go find alpha and has, you know, the two kind of ways that we think about our, our research and what we tell our research team is like one, if it's on crypto Twitter, it's already too late. Um, so what that means is like, it allows them to look past the echo bubble. So this is how they're always looking for, you know, the narratives that they think will emerge in the next six, nine, 12 months, whatever. Um, and then two, um, no matter what you write about, it has to be the deepest possible dive on that topic. Um, and, you know, happy, you know, if anyone wants to like, yeah. read us, you know, challenge us on that and like read a specific report, um, we can send one on Athena, Celestia, whatever have you. But, um, I think those two things allow our research team to go deeper than, you know, uh, a fun research team would go just for a quick due diligence. And I think that allows them yeah. to build a lot of expertise um, that can help us make much better decisions on any of the divisions, right? Um, yeah, and, and that's the, the, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Jose. No, I think the, the other big thing is just that the, the sum of the, the whole is way more valuable than the sum of its parts. In, in my mind, like each business benefits from these flywheels uh, from, from each other really strongly. So like, I think the research is much better and more actionable because it has a, the, the ventures lens where we're really looking for alpha, looking for stuff that, that that's investable, looking for the next trend and like that, uh, and having the team there to kind of help guide that and, and refine that process. Cause a lot of the research in this space is really good, but a lot of it is quite academic, right? Like it's maybe explaining how something works to you, what data availability is and stuff like mm. this, but it's not really like alpha focused in the same way. And then also having access to labs, like actual builders who can go look at code, look at read audit reports, um, like understand how this stuff works, have deployed protocols with billions of dollars of TVL in them. Like that's sort of priceless. Um, and then the same thing obviously goes for, for ventures, like having access to the, to the research side, to, to some of the best like thinkers in the space, people that are, that are deep in, in rabbit holes across all the different sectors of crypto, having access to the builders. So I, I guess it's, it's hard for me to see how, uh, this any one of the businesses could be more valuable to someone else than to us, you know, like how, how any like separating one of the businesses, how, how that could create more like how someone would be willing to pay what it's worth to us, I think is 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 like a tough thing for, for, for me to see. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. One tricky thing could be. 
like that we've been thinking about is if you do a services or consulting engagement, how do you think about selling the token? Like let's use Axie, for example. Like if you are really close with the Axie founders and you were almost like help build the thing, yeah. then at some point you at some point you need to sell the token to realize some sort of gains. But then it's almost like a the personal element of that is like the founders like, hey, why'd you sell my tokens? Yeah. Um, and I think that happens with a lot of protocols. For, and 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 that's not just with Delphi, it's with every venture firm. If you're super close with someone, you seeded them, like eventually you have to sell it. How do you guys think about that? Yeah, maybe I can talk about it from the consulting angle and then Jan, you can talk about ventures, but I feel like the answers are pretty similar. Um, we're very like long only. Um, we we uh, diamond hand most of our bags for sure, but obviously if they go up by, you know, 50, 100 X, um, it's just like, you know, just reasonable to kind of take some money off the table. Um, Basically, always uh, on either side, consulting or ventures, we'll talk, be talking to the team and kind of give them a heads up, et cetera. Obviously, do it very slowly if we are doing. Um, and basically, every I, I can't remember the last thing that we have sold 100% of anything. Um, like, we still have exposure to Axie, still have, you know, like, um, to this day, right? And that was our second investment. We still have exposure to Room. <laughs> that was our first ever yeah. investment. Um, so, yeah, honestly, I think we've, sometimes maybe done been too friendly about this um because yeah. <laughs> like you know sometimes it's definitely helped you know block some sales right where they're like oh you know can you just not do it now or like fuck you know we should have just done it but um yeah i think then in the day like the space is like much smaller than people realize and you know the main thing that you got to kind of like um you know make sure you, you have is your reputation and trust right and i think these are teams that like we, you know, especially for us, we work with really closely on both the consulting side and the venture side. So these aren't just like, you know, investment number 38 to us. These are like, hey, we actually, you know, for, hopefully help to make this happen. Right. Um, so, yeah, I think it's like a little bit different where we were much closer to these guys than the usual. Yeah. It's also, you know, uh, understanding what the correct environment to do it in is and, and you know, making sure that you aren't creating negative impacts on price and, and waiting until there's the liquidity to do so and, and also doing it very slowly. Um, it, it is inevitable and, and um, is kind of just part of the business, but I, I'd say we do hold more than most, especially just kind of chatting with peers and, and hearing. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. What, in in what general, it's like when the thesis has changed materially from the initial one and it's almost, almost, it's always like an opportunity cost decision, right? With like what other opportunities mm. you, have, you have available. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's also pretty important. Like, have they stuck to the, the thesis that we laid out? Has it played out? What's changed? And being really, like, being able to react to that. Yeah. Yeah, I just imagine it could, and maybe I'm overthinking, but some, like, let's say Ventures, Ventures is really like, it's time to sell. sell. It's time to sell. And Anil's like, wait, 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 or I don't know who run, whoever runs the services business or consulting business is like, whoa, wait, wait, we have like a $3 million engagement with them. Like, like it's, it's done at the end of the year. We can't sell, like. I just, I imagine it could yeah. be tricky. But. To be fair, it, it, like, I don't, I can't even think there might be one or two of those opportunities. We, we've we we've yeah. been pretty uh, separate between, you know, what we've invested in and what we consult in um, just based on, you know, so our, our team is lean from a venture side, but we're able to, I think, deliver a lot more on the Portco side because of how much we're able to kind of tap into the other resources. So uh, what I'm basically mm. saying is um, we, we do a decent amount on the Portco side that I think um, typically you can charge for as consulting. And yeah. so oftentimes there won't really be overlap in between Portcos and, and what happens on the consulting side for research. Hey everyone, Jason here. I wanted to talk about something that's been on my mind a lot recently, and that is where are all of crypto's killer apps? We often ask this question on this show, so I'm excited to tell you about Empire's latest partner, Anoma, the universal intent machine. Intents are a new way to build dApps, enabling users to say what they want without needing to specify how it's done. Let's say you have an NFT on one chain, but you wanna swap it for a token on another chain. To make things even worse, you also don't know Know which bridge to trust or how to navigate different DEXs on each chain. Disaster, right? But here's the good news. Thanks to Intense, you can just tell the app what you want to do and a Noma's solver network 
takes care of all the complexity in the background. We're excited to see what cool dApps Anoma's architecture will unlock. To stay up to date with Anoma, you can follow them at x.com slash Anoma or sign up for the newsletter at anoma.net. Special thanks to Anoma for sponsoring today's episode. Hey everyone, I wanted to take a second to talk about Real, a permissionless L2 for tokenized real world assets on Arbitrum Orbit. What's really cool about Real is that it uses the off-chain yields from RWAs as a sustainable solution for native liquidity incentives. Real is also the first L2 where 100% of profits from transaction fees and fees from protocols accrue back to the L2's governance token, RWA. Real has just launched their rewards program where 10% of the RWA supply is being given away to early users of the chain. Users can provide concentrated liquidity, trade, borrow, and leverage tokenized real-world assets, including T-bills, real estate, and tokenized basis trades. Just as a quick disclaimer, this is not investment advice or product solicitation and not aimed at U.S. persons. Find out more at re.al slash rewards. Special thanks to Real for sponsoring today's episode. Hey everyone, we all know that there's a massive shortage of top senior marketers in crypto. We've seen it over and over that teams are constantly struggling to get their go-to market done right. That's why we're excited to have partnered up with Renault Partners, the premier go-to-market advisory firm for early stage crypto teams. They help top founders tell their stories better and build great non-technical teams. They advise founders on all things marketing, including tight brand positioning, community building, social media, and building A-plus internal teams. Don't just take it from us. They work with some of the top projects across Solana, Monad, Base, and many more. If you're a founder or a VC looking for support for your teams, I highly recommend connecting with them. Get in touch with their team by heading on over to renaudpartners.com or giving the co-founder Jeff a follow on X. Check out the links in the description below. What, I want to start talking about just this cycle and making money in this cycle and stuff like that. But um, maybe we can wrap this first part of the podcast by just like, like, what does Delphi look like in 10 years? Is it just more of the same? Just like the three lines of business, but 10 times bigger? Or like, what, what, what's the grand vision here? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, honestly, the way that I think about it is like, having a five, 10 year plan in crypto is like, you're not going to make it. So like, don't spend too much time thinking about that. I think what we've been really good at is being able to adapt and be resilient. Um, you know, from all, uh, a few of the stories that we've already told today, but like, there's many, many countless more, like, Every single time that we thought something had to happen for Delphi to be successful, that thing ended up not happening and it ended up making us better for it. Um, so we do have North Stars, right? Um, for us, like, again, like the whole vision is just to make crypto happen sooner and better, better than it would without us. And I think like for, you know, on the research side, um, some of our you know members have already started seeing a lot of these community features. Um, you know, I know the Blockers team was just talking to us about it a, a few months ago. Like we have these things like inline comments and like alpha feed and things like this. Um, and you can kind of see this start turning in this community portal where it's not just, you know, the research team is just um, uh, one of the, of the many members adding value through, through all these features and uh, things that we're having. Right. And I think my dream on the research side, at least, is, you know, kind of like eating our own dog food as far as like integrating and working with a lot of crypto components and bringing that on uh, in, into the portal too. Um, Cause that would really mean that crypto is made to, to a stage where it makes sense to integrate into our, you know, web two business. Right. Um, so that's like the way I think about that ventures. I think, you know, Jan, like uh, yeah, happy for you to jump into, but I think like we want to do this forever. <laughs> like we're, we're super bullish. Um, I, I think like people always say that, you know, Crypto is early, but like the way that I think about it is like the internet is really early, right? It's like 20 years old at this point. So like um, what I'm most excited about is like the next, you know, 100 years of crypto um, and, and what that looks like. And we're going to be around there. Um, and yeah, Jose, I'm curious, you know, Labs Labs is an interesting one too. We've already built a lot of pro projects here. And basically how Labs works is we come up with an idea, we find a team, we give them a lot of our resources, right? Both from like the token design to, um, you know, uh, um, regular, regulatory, like legal, et cetera, design. And then we spin out these teams eventually. And right now um, we have a bunch of, um, this year is going to be a big year for us because we have a bunch of those kind of coming to market. Um, and I think, you know, for the first time in a while, we're kind of like, hey, we don't want to, you know, we, we take on more incubations right now and kind of focus on those projects. So 
yeah, it's kind of like, you know, playing it by ear for sure. Nice. Yeah, no, not to, you know, I think on, on the venture side, certainly want to continue investing. And I think, yeah, the decision making will mostly be around strategy, which I think, you know, kind of rolls into what you wanted to go into next, which is um, how to make money in, in, in the space right now in the market. Um, you know, we've deviated a bit, but we're, because it's, you know, prop and and our, our mandate is, is very flexible in the sense that, you know, it's not really a mandate per se. It's just how we're thinking about the space and, and our thesis can change over time. And, and so um, I think our investing, uh, our investments will reflect that, um, which, you know, shuffles between liquid, venture, uh, sometimes late, sometimes early stage. Uh, and it, yeah, it, it really varies. But I think mostly we'll just kind of continue investing and, and just adjust how we do it over time, but, but directionally, um, yeah. want to continue doing the same thing. Just not, not just to summarize, I think like the way I see it is research is sort of, um, unearthing the alpha, like identifying where the alpha is in the industry, the interesting things that are happening. Ventures is deploying like financial capital against that. And then labs is deploying like intellectual capital against that and like plugging the holes. So it's like ventures is investing. And then from everything we see in the industry, from all the, the working with teams from, from like, seeing what's happening, we identify holes, and then we try and go and find teams and incubate teams to build that. So I mean, one easy example is a project that's going to be announcing soon. It actually might have done its first tweet by the time this goes out called Legion, which is like help, helping bring back ICOs, which for us, like obviously we've benefited a lot from the status quo being venture investors, um, but we really think ICOs are actually much more, um, like made a lot of sense. They're much more egalitarian. Uh, and like a lot of the stuff, a lot of the regulations actually ended up making it much worse for, for retail investors. So there's that with Metalex, Gabe Shapiro's new project that we incubated. That's again, trying to make like governance um, way more agile, way more seamless. Um, it's a it's pr problem we've run into over and over again, different ways. We don't think that the current decentralized governance scales, but we do think decentralized governance can be better than corporate governance because corporate governance isn't that good. That's the, I think the thing people don't realize when you have to like sign these board resolutions, do all this stuff. Um, and I think Gabe's the perfect person to build that. And like Almanac, like AI agents platform, they've been building for, for two and a half years, like before AI was even a thing. So like, it's just trying to find where we think the opportunities are and, and find teams to, to build that. And I, I hope we're still doing all of that in, in, in 10 years. Hmm. Jose and Jan, maybe you can take us into this next part. Like, how are you guys thinking about just, I don't know, we're making money in this cycle. Like that's a really broad question, but like liquid venture, what areas, what narratives are overhyped? What's underhyped? Like just, yeah, take us into this. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, I guess, so on the liquid side, um, I think the tricky thing relative to previous cycles was you know the just the the fact that not everything goes up now whereas before it, you just have to kind of be right and, and bet on the fastest horse and, and and that was it i i think you know that, that's happened that that's not as much of a thing for a combination of reasons one you know there's increasing the amount of tokens uh i think there's a bit less retail and then the big one is, you know, people have, have wised up a bit and, and you know, for, for a handful of reasons, one, you have kind of historical data to look at. And then there's also an element of, of survivorship bias, right, where um, naturally you, you can't continue with that strategy and survive. And so those that have helped that play out in the sense that all tokens go up have gotten burned. And, and, and so now you, you kind of have, uh, you know, individual stuff going up periodically and and you also have this kind of hot ball of money dynamic that that forces you to really see rotations rather than uh, kind of everything going up consistently. So, um, you know, I think that's one of the things. And then the other is uh, value accrual has been difficult for a couple of reasons. One is the, the regulatory element, right? And, and then the other is um, business, like apps that are successful enough to make a lot of money that and enough money to sustain valuations. Right. And, and so, because we haven't seen too much of that, um, you've, you, you haven't seen a lot of individual kind of tokens do well on, on fundamentals. It's been, you know, more narrative hot ball of money type of, 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 um, price action. I think the, the, the growth of memes, um, 
has also contributed to that a bit in the sense that um, you know there's only a finite amount of money that's going to get deployed, and when um, when there's uh, the, the casino element of, of memes um, becomes a bit more appealing, it's very reflexive, right? As more people pile into memes, it becomes more compelling to do so because there's a lot more attention there, and so um, I think. You know, the fact that you saw memes run up late last cycle, that kind of got front run combined with, I think it, they've also absorbed a lot of the NFT money because of the ease around speculating around something fungible and, and the fact that you have perps around it. Um, that's cannibalized a lot of the demand for tokens that would be otherwise uh, deployed into. So, you know, you've had this barbell of, of kind of majors and memes and then uh, big washouts uh, on, on, on rallies and dips um, on everything in between. And so... Um, it's, it's been tricky, right? You can, you can, it, it boils down to, you know, does it make more sense to almost take a, a smaller leverage long on, on majors or, or if you're, I mean, so purely on the, on the liquid side, right. Or, or does it make more sense to try and, uh, you know, dive bomb in, into memes? I think it really depends on portfolio size and um, and and perceived edge. I guess in in those relative sectors, some people are are really good at memes, but um, I think for the most part they aren't. Like you saw even the the pump fund stats, right? Like the, yeah. it, it went in terms of the uh, the profitability of uh, the, the the percentage of of participants in profit is is insanely small, and and that's as in the trenches as it gets, right? So it's it's just another kind of example of how. Uh, I think difficult and, and and cutthroat it's been where people are cheating earlier. There's there's less kind of longer term holding. Everything's kind of felt like a bit more of a of a trade rather than a longer term yeah. play. And I and I think you know that feeds on itself and, and has made the the liquid component uh, in terms of buy and hold really difficult. I think you've seen traders excel more than than buy and hold. You have, you know, you'll have a handful of the buy and hold guys who, who not get lucky, but are early into a memes and are able to hold it through these ridiculous returns. But most of the times um, that, that those profits are given back. And so uh, I think on the liquid side, it's been a much more of a trader environment than an investor one, um, you know, and, and then couple that with the fact that you just have the the, the unlocks on, on low flow, high FD meme tokens, really kind of pushing people away from projects, which I think. You know, for some of them makes sense because they're just coming out at, at, at kind of silly valuations and, and you're basically just exit liquidity to some extent. Um, yeah, traders got, I mean, like hodlers got killed, right? Which kind of contributes to the overall culture that we see in crypto now. Like the survivorship bias just means anyone who is super high conviction hodler just got wrecked, whether it was Luna or FTX, you know. And like there's like a lot of, just, just a lot of like anger on the timeline. And, yeah, uh, a lot of anger. I think Ceteris, Ceteris said it on the, um, on the Hive Mind potties, like, the market right now is just driving everyone crazy. Like it's yeah. yeah. I mean, if you missed so and and you and like most people didn't make money with memes, I think. And if you missed so, you kind of like didn't really make that much money this cycle. Yeah. For, I think for, a good yeah. good example of, of of that anger is you know people constantly saying, "Oh, I can't wait for the bull market," but you know Bitcoin's near all time highs and and all yeah. like so many things have ripped and everyone's. No, I, I just think crypto's lost its way a little bit. This 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 market and kind of like. All the stuff people used to harp about, um, like censorship resistant money or like decentralized trust. I think all this stuff still matters and it's still the USP. And if this stuff is is gonna is gonna do anything in the world, it's it's by sticking to to like those those principles. Yeah, maybe just before getting into these specific narratives, where do you think we are in the market? Like this this cycle and the whole the whole cycle conversation is a, is a tough one is a tough one, I think. But what what is your best like analysis of where we're at in this cycle. I, I think we're still fairly early uh, or, or like, you know, approaching halfway, uh, but it, but it ultimately kind of depends on uh, a, a, how a few things from here play out, you know, election being one of them. I think, you know, if you get a Harris presidency, that probably means um, you get more of a barbell type uh, growth in 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 uh, in a lot of these names in the sense that you'll have Bitcoin do well because there's just going to be kind of massive spending and, and kind of it'll accelerate the, the currency debasement element. So I think you'll see you know gold and, and Bitcoin to do well, and at the same time, you know the, that regulatory framework will push 
more people into memes because there's just no risk to their securities, right? So that that's the kind of the barbell that I was describing. And then I think if you get a, a Trump presidency, I, I still think you'll have Bitcoin do well, even if you know they go and and, and spend less, they're still going to spend, right? That's just what, what's going to happen. And so um, you'll still have spending, and then you'll have regulatory frameworks, hopefully that will give builders a lot of comfort in in kind of building in the US or serving US customers, which I think is a, is a pretty big headwind that we've seen, you know, just on the venture side in terms of builder risk appetite to, 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 you know, build something that kind of can accrue value or, or, or does engage with US users. And so um, I, I do see more of a, of a broad based rally if you get a kind of a, a, a Trump presidency. Hmm. Yeah, maybe I can also add some crazy bullishness here. And by the way, I'm a, I'm a permable. So like, uh, again, not financial <laughs> advice. I've been wrong many times before. Um, this is probably like in a weird way, um, the most bullish I've been in a while. Um, maybe, maybe ever for crypto, mostly because I think like, you know, obviously you have things like ETFs and stuff and, and, and break cuts coming up. But I think like when we first got into the space, I think like even then ETF sounded crazy, but they were still on kind of like our map, right? Like, Still, people were like, oh, yeah, it'd be cool if we ever got a Bitcoin ETF or something like that, right? Um, and now we're here. But I remember when we got in the space, it was, I always thought crypto was going to succeed despite government being against it, right? Um, and I think this year, what kind of started blowing my mind is there's going to be a scenario where governments are actually helping us, <laughs> you know, push crypto forward, which, you know, I think all of us are re really aware, like, crypto you know, at its core is kind of like anti-government technology, right? In many ways. And so the fact that, you know, because of these short-term election cycles and their short-term incentives, like you all of a sudden have people um, on both sides trying to kind of pander to our kind of like audience and our, our yeah. demographic and our industry um, kind of blows my mind. And I think it's like something that, you know, nowadays I think people just have a lot of um, catalysts like numbness um, we're just always looking to sell the news or buy the rumor or something like that. And I think like at the end of the day, you got to realize that a lot of these things that are happening are actually big catalysts, like the ETS being passed, like Trump, you know, going to Nashville and, and, and talking, uh, you know, about Bitcoin and everything like that. So, yeah, I, I'm really bullish. And I think, you know, to what Jan was saying, too, I think people are really underestimating how bullish it is for a uh, regime change where you actually get a positive regulatory environment for crypto. Because that would make, you know, it would kind of like bring in, I think, a new wave of builders who are a little bit more risk averse beforehand, as well as give opportunities to current builders in ways other than just launching a token, right? Like, Anna, you and I were talking about this just, you know, last week at Drinks, when I think the IPO market is something that people don't really give that much um, kind of like credit to or pay a lot of attention to. But that is a huge way of, you know, for people to want to build companies and products that maybe don't have a token in the middle of it yeah. um, on top of these protocols and things like that. So, yeah, I'm super bullish. Um, I think people on the timeline are, need to get off crypto Twitter, go touch grass and stuff. And yeah, and I think like Jose said it right, like, um, you know, if you're spending too much time in over trading right now, just buy the majors and enjoy, you know, the, the outsized returns. Um, and, and kind of like keep your mental health, I think, is like the main thing that I tell people. Like a lot of the conversation I'm having, I'm like, you're overthinking this right now. I'm with you. I'm like, Bitcoin's at 60K and interest rates are higher than they've been in years. And we're about to go into and they're, and they're going to start coming down. Like Bitcoin hit an all time high with when we were jacking interest rates higher. Like now we're about to bring them down. Like don't don't over the dollars rolling over. Like we're entering a dollar bear market. Like just don't. Don't uh yeah don't overthink this one. I'm with you. Yeah, right and to me more more macro wise, I just feel like the world is becoming multipolar. You know, like the U.S. is retreating inwards. Like these are all the conditions that crypto needs long term to succeed. And to me, to replace like because the the U.S. is basically the policeman of the of the world, right? Of, of the oceans, the dollar, the global world cur currency. Um, I think that's increasingly going to change, and that is the conditions that you need for crypto to kind of succeed. And to me, I still see. A world where like every asset um you know debt instrument commodity is going to be traded on chain it's just the biggest market it's like the global market and especially as markets become more and more siloed you know investing in chinese markets super hard investing in the us is hard for certain kinds of people now um i just think like on chain will become the the global the only global permissionless like 
market. And right now it's memes, but um, I think there's going to be a lot of other stuff. And, and, yeah. and it's basically the way I think about it is what infrastructure do we need to build for that to happen? Like what, what, if you think about a world in 10 years from now where we've won, like every, every asset's trading on chain and what infrastructure needs to be built for that to, for that to happen. And that's kind of what we try and try and look for and back. Jose, give me three hottest narratives in this upcoming cycle. Um, I still think gaming, like, uh, we've been, we've been bullish, uh, we've been bullish gaming for a while. I still think gaming is, is going to be the one that brings in the most users. Um, and we have a game and I think there's a lot of alpha in being, being like watching the play tests and, and like being early to see which games are actually good, especially if you're a gamer, which a lot of crypto people are. Uh, and we've recently invested in one uh, we actually missed all the rounds for the, for this game. Uh, we just like spoke to the team recently watched a bit a few of the demos and have just been like buying up uh in, a, in every way we can on secondaries and stuff called Godzilla and to me that's like an example of what that like a top sort of shooter with that's fully committed to to, to crypto and an on-chain experience can look like like it's a sort of a war zone level in, in my mind shooter um or like more of an extraction shooter I guess like escape from Tarkov or something and yeah I've just been watching people play that. Um, and I just think like something like that will really show the potential of what gaming can do and has like a really good chance to bring in like tens of millions of, of, of users to crypto and probably the best chance. Um, then other than that, I'm, I'm bullish. I don't know if Jan, you want to add anything there on the gaming side, probably the best and most avid gamer among us other than peers. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I think, you know, the gaming element just takes a lot longer to build out. And so, you know, everyone was kind of used to the short feedback loops of, of DeFi forks and everything else. And, and so um, I think that's part of why uh, gaming has trended the way it did along with, with some other stuff. And maybe it's, it's a, a different longer conversation, but happy to dive into that. And then, and yeah, another one is, is Hytopia that, that we're super bullish on, uh, on, on top, which um, is, is basically taking Minecraft and, creating so minecraft is you know you have your players and then uh, everyone who's creating the worlds uh which are the world's creators and and so that's what is continuing the massive user base that that minecraft currently has so what what hytopia is doing is basically um taking the, from the player side a game that's just like minecraft is right now but with, with improvements to to uh ux and, and 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 quality of life uh elements and then at the same time, uh, from the creator side, it's creating it's it's allowing them to do what they do, but better monetize than they currently do. So we think you know there's a a, a nine figure amount of, of monthly active users on on Minecraft, and so we think that that is going to be one of the biggest games to onboard a lot of people into the space where users can play from a browser and it's the exact same way they play now. And then creators have can continue doing exactly what they do in Minecraft, but, but monetize it through the benefits of, of crypto rails and, and kind of what tokens can offer. And so we think the combination of the two will be a really compelling way to, to bring over a lot of users and another one that we're, we're very excited about. Mm. Jose, what's uh, what's narrative number two? Or Jan, you can go ahead. I, I guess there's kind of two worlds I saw with AI. One is the, the, like the incumbents, the big tech companies, own all the models and like they, they own the AGI, everyone interacts through, through them, right? These massive models, they have all the compute, they have the talent, they have the distribution to monetize the models, right? With, with WhatsApp and Office and stuff like this, and they just win. Um, and I think recently uh, what we've seen is first of all, Meta, like the unlikely hero, Mark Zuckerberg is, is like keeping open source relevant. Um, and, and that's like really bullish for, for, for crypto. And then also I think the, the other part of it is just that it's very hard for a generalized model to be like most cost efficient for everything, right? These models by their very nature are going to be super expensive to, to train. Um, and, and so they're going to, they're going to need to be expensive. Like inference is going to be expensive too on them. And so I think by necessity um, you're going to end up, or I guess it's probabilistic, right? Like I think there's a greater chance that you end up with millions of models, millions of small specialized models, um, some of which are, are actually trained on the, on, on the bigger models. Um, that, that serve specific use cases because people are always going to want like the most cost efficient way to, to serve whatever use case they have. And I think a world with that world is much more bullish for crypto XAI than, than like the other world where the, the sort of big, big tech companies just dominate everything. And I think that's the world that we're, that we're headed towards. And then it's like, 
I, I just think that the the thesis for censorship resistant AI, um, it, it's sort of the same, like it's the same exact thesis that for Bitcoin, right? If, if money was like one of the most important resources in, in the world, arguably the most important, and you needed this decentralized form of money that couldn't be controlled and manipulated by the state, um, intelligence, I think, and, and compute is now the most important resource in the world, like being able to produce and, and scale, uh, produce intelligence at scale. And um, right now it's entirely dominated by a few centralized entities. And I think like there needs to be, and there will be demand for uh, a decentralized form of intelligence and like decentralized, decentralized censorship resistant run locally. Yeah. Jose, uh, I'll tell you my extremely left bell curve AI take from uh, my beginning of the year prediction, which was um, AI is going to keep ripping as a narrative as like a mainstream public narrative and uh, retail investors are going to want, want some allocation to AI, but the only like very obvious public market allocation to AI is NVIDIA. And then I think there's like Microsoft yeah. and Facebook, but like those aren't like pure play AI plays, at least not in the minds of retail. So retail's like, I, I want to buy some sort of AI coin or like I want exposure to AI. NVIDIA, the chart looks too expensive. So let me allocate to the only other way to get exposure right now is from crypto tokens. And I think like I have zero, I haven't done any due diligence. You know, this world literally a hundred times better than me. Some sort of like, they're probably going to buy the basic ones. It's like Akash and Render and BitTensor and like, I, again, I have no, I don't, I don't know which one of those is better mm -hmm. than the other and stuff like that. But I, I think that's the super left curve, like retail driven. Yeah. Uh, I think if you want, I agree with that. And I, I think that's all you need. Uh, like right curve and left curve are the same. If you want like the right curve take on it, I would definitely read like the recent Delphi DAI reports. There was, there were like some of the best reading I've seen on like the AI thesis both the, the ideological reasons for it, the practical reasons for it, and then like actually where to find alpha, like what are the sectors within crypto AI that make most sense and are most interesting. It's like that was, uh, and I think that one's been made yeah, free on the portal now as well. And uh, yeah, th those yeah, are really, really good. Tower really helped refine public, my thinking. Yeah, yeah. It, it just went public last week. Yeah, that, that one was really good. Actually, yeah, I think, you know, Jose's definitely gone way deeper and, and, and same with like Tom and, you know, Cam from our team, like shout out those guys. Um, but yeah, reading those reports definitely helped me build conviction and like, this wasn't just going to be buzzwords and it's going to be a sector that people are going to mid curve, to be honest. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, I totally agree. Um, yeah. And I'll throw a weird question to you. If um, it feels like there's starting to be more and more dispersion in crypto, like it all used to just move together and now, now it doesn't really move together. If they're related to like the L1, L2 trade, if there were only going to be like three or four chains that make it out of this bull market with like outsized, not just returns, but like activity, I'd say, what do you think that's going to be? Uh, so, you know, uh, you have your ETH and, and solar are pretty consensus bets. So, um, so, with, so with ETH, like instead of ETH, would it be like pick maybe one or two of the L2s if you think the activity goes there? Oh, the L2s? Uh, I mean, I think base is probably... Um, the, the, the most obvious one, um, just based on, you know, the, the access they have to users and the amount of additional incentives they can offer to, um, potential port codes or potential, uh, apps to build on them via access to the Coinbase user base. So we, we've kind of gone back and forth on this in terms of like, yeah, you know, RL2 is actually bearish for ETH. And, and, um, I do think what we need in order for the space to really move forward or, or successful apps. And I, I think what L2s offer are a lot of additional shots on yep. goal to help find those successful apps. Um, so what, like what they take away from ETH in terms of fees, I think they more than make up for in terms of additional users, viral apps, and also kind of moneyness of ETH to some extent where you have, you know, additional people that are holding it using as collateral or, or, or you know, whatever it might be. In, within the apps themselves. So I do think base is probably um, the, the best L2 to, 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 to have breakout. And then, you know, I think if you do get a, a Trump presidency with a, uh, you know, a reset in the SEC, there's, there's the opportunity for a base token um, where, where they're not necessarily as kind of afraid about that either, which, um, you know, will be tricky because unless they kind of decentralize the sequencer, it's still, going to be thought of similarly to uh, Arbitrum 
and, and optimism in terms of, you know, just being something I just that think, you use yeah. for grants. Yeah. Yeah, I just think L1s and L2s are just sort of the generalized L2s and L1s are just like testing grounds for successful apps and every actual successful app will end up on its own execution environment. Like we've already seen it with, with crypto, right? Like DYDX, uh, Axie, like even USDC has its own like issuance chain, right? Like I think every successful app in crypto is going to want granular control over its execution environment, over its consensus. And so I'm like, uh, I'm, and you're seeing it with Solana already too, right? Like it's a narrative violation, but there's already, I think six L2s on, on Solana. Again, the yeah. recent Delphi reports covers this really well. There's like six specialized L2s on Solana that are each doing their own thing because they, they don't want to inherit. Um, like you, when you, when you launch an L1, you inherit every single design choice and trade-off that the L1 made. I think the thing is, even on Solana, you don't see that many apps which require like synchronous atomic composability, right? Where the state actually touches each other. Uh, and so I think the reason L2 suck right now is just that the interoperability experience between them sucks. But I, I think there's way less like actual need for that than, than people talk about. But again, we have differing opinions on this, on this internally. And I just think you, there, you think about like, what does, because ETH, already like data availability rollups are using Celestia. So like, what do you really want from an L1 as a, as a, like, if you're an app chain, if you're an L2 app chain, what do you really want from your, from your like settlement layer? Right. And it's like, you want basically uh, all the, all the main native stable coins, right? So you don't have to like bridge, you use some bridge and inherit bridge risk. You want native assets with good liquidity. Um, you want like wallet integrations and stuff to make it easy to, to, for people to, to, to use you like, make it very easily accessible. And then probably you want like some community and users, like initial users for your thing, right? Which is what Solana really gives you right now. If you launch on Solana and in general ecosystems give you, like if you launch on Solana or in an ecosystem, you get all the hype from, from people who are bullish on that ecosystem, people who are bullish. So, um, whereas if you launch on your own Island, it's much more difficult. You have to bootstrap all that from scratch. And an issue for me is like thinking about that from first principles, what does it look like? What do you want from the settlement layer and really optimizing for that? And I'm, you're already seeing, some really interesting builders choose to build like um, their rollups on there because of the, the the tools they have. And I think you're going to see a lot of that this cycle. You're, you're already seeing it, right? Like I think Athena has just recently announced Athena chain, which is um, I'm really bullish on sort of the, the idea of building a whole chain around a, uh, around a stable coin. You know, we've heard that one before. Didn't split it, but I think it's uh, I think it's like still makes a lot of sense. It's the killer app. And I think stable coins right now are crypto's killer app for better or for worse. And I think building an entire chain UX around that and with all the apps serving that makes a lot of sense. Um, but in general, I think every successful app is going to end up making this decision, honestly. Hmm. Jen's good pod. Anything else you guys wanted to, uh, wanted to cover on Delphi, the markets, liquid versus venture, anything that we missed here? No, man. I, I think, uh, yeah, I think it was a lot of fun. Cool. Yeah, this is great. Thanks, man. Yeah, really appreciate Good. it. All right, Anil, uh, Jose, Jan, always rooting for you guys. Uh, appreciate the time. And uh, yeah, excited to have the high find uh, on the Empire feed. Let's go. Same here. Likewise. This is cool. awesome. Really appreciate it. Thanks for watching today's episode. Just wanted to quickly mention that the wait for crypto's killer app wave is nearly over thanks to today's sponsor, Anoma, the universal intent machine. To stay up to date with Anoma, you can follow them at x.com slash Anoma or sign up for the newsletter at anoma.net. Thanks again to Anoma for sponsoring today's episode.